WC, thank you for being here with us this morning. We're so glad that we can have some people back in person in the sanctuary to worship together this morning. And we're also grateful for those of you who are with us online through YouTube and Facebook. Before we get to the service, let's get into your morning announcements. If you're interested in joining us for in-person worship next week, that'll be Sunday, March 21st, you can do so by the sign-up link that'll be coming uh, early this week, so watch out for that. Or if you don't have access to the internet, or if you'd prefer, you can give us a call to the church office at 444-8108 and we'll do our best to accommodate you. Remember, it's best to sign up as early as possible as soon as the link is released because we need to do seating plans and space is limited. Don't forget, if you'd like to tithe or give money to the church, you can do so by sending an e-transfer to giving at douglaschurch.ca. That's giving at douglaschurch.ca. There's a few other ways that you can give as well, and you can find those on our website at douglaschurch.ca slash give. DBC Kids has put together a very fun and meaningful Easter craft for you to do with your family. So if you would like to get your hands on one of those craft kits, you can just go to our website and see the most recent weekly update, our newsletter, and there's a link there to sign up to get your kit. That's it for your announcements this morning. For any of you sleepyheads who may have dozed off during my announcements because you didn't get enough sleep, Due to the time change, you can always go back and watch our services back on our YouTube page and our Facebook page, and you can find our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Douglas Baptist. Please join us, and I'll hand it over now to the worship team. Well, good morning and welcome to worship. It is good to see you in the flesh, and it is good to welcome those of you who are online. You are seen as well. This is the day the Lord has made, and let us rejoice and be glad in it. I just want to invite you to stand with us as we sing. If you're at home, I just encourage you to take whatever posture of worship is comfortable for you. And, and you know that goes the same in this place as well. If you're comfortable standing, we invite you to do that. If you're more comfortable sitting, you are also welcome to do that. I also just want to remind you as we do sing and it's a public building and all the things change all the time, we do ask that you keep your masks on throughout the service and while you're in this space. Let's just open our service with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for being in this place. God, we thank you that you see us and that you welcome and you invite us into your presence, into worship with you. And so, Father, I pray that as we are here gathered as your church across this city, across this world, in this place, in our homes, God, I pray that our worship will be pleasing to you and it will bring glory to you. This is all for you, God. And we thank you for all the things that you do for us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Declare the battle one, declare 
of the faithfulness of God. I hope and I pray that you can say that. The same faithfulness that we read about in God's word, the same faithfulness that we just sang about. You know, in good times, in times of great joy and rejoice, in troubling times, in hard and overwhelming and anxious times, in all times, our God is faithful. He is faithful. We do not have to be afraid. In Isaiah 40, verse 8, it says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. We don't have to be afraid when we can stand firm in God's faithfulness. When we can read about the firm foundation that God has given us through his holy word that word that stands through the test of all time. In that word, we read about God's comfort, about his love. We get to experience that love. And we learn about the hope that is only found in Christ. In Christ alone, my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are stilled when striving cease my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, 
this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on the cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain and bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since Christ has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ no guilt in love no fear in death this is the power of christ in me from life's first cry to final breath jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he turns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand I'm excited today to just take a moment and introduce to you our Easter offering project. We want to come alongside a wonderful organization that's doing good things in the name of Jesus. We value generosity. We know that there are good things going on in our community, and so we want to share our Easter offering. And so half of our Easter offering is going to go to support this partner, the Village of Hope. The Village of Hope is a drug and alcohol regeneration center and they run a 10-month Christian-based program right here in New Brunswick in Upper Tracy. And uh, we are excited to come alongside of them. We've known of the good work they've been doing and how they've been supporting those who have struggles with drugs and alcohol. And we just want to continue to affirm what they're doing. We want to put our money where our mouth is and where our prayers are. And we just want to support them this Easter. So when you give to our Easter offering, half of what you give will go to the Village of Hope. It will go to support a specific project that is aimed at helping families of the men that are there. You see, the families need support. They need healing. They need hope too. They need to learn and grow together and heal together. And so the Village of Hope is looking to put into place a family center cabins, a place where families can come and they can heal together as the men are there doing the 10 month uh, treatment program. And so we wanna be involved in that. It's really a project that has resonated with our missions team and we believe it's an important one. We want to see families brought together and we want to see healing happen within families and marriages. And so that's why we're supporting it. And I want you to hear today from Andrew. Andrew will be sharing a little bit about the vision. Andrew's the executive director of Village of Hope. And then you're going to hear from one of our very own DBC families who have been through some struggles themselves as a family. And they understand the importance of a family center and the opportunity to heal as a family. So I know you're gonna be touched and moved as you hear about the dream, the vision, and how important it is. The third thing on there is our family center. And so this was uh, always a dream of ours, and this was also a part 
of the ministry where we trained in, down in Florida. They had about 40 hotel rooms on site. And so wives and kids can come on the weekends and go through family classes together and everybody can experience healing. Um, you know, um, in the marriages, uh, otherwise, these guys would say, oh, I can't I can't be away from my family that long. And so they try to tough it out on their own. And these guys end up coming back to the program single. They've lost their family and they lost everything. And so this is in an effort to save these marriages before they fall apart, to save these families. Um, and so uh, a man can become a husband again or learn how to become a husband to his wife and a father to his children. And so we'll teach the family classes on the weekends. The, the kids, the, they can come out and stay in the cabins together. There'll be like nice little hotel rooms. We'll have activities for them on site there. And so really there's nothing like this that I know of, even in Atlantic Canada, uh, where wives and kids can come on the weekends. So we're so thankful for these projects. We still have some funds to raise on the family center cabins, uh, but we believe that we're going to get there. And um, we just want to thank you so much. Um, for, for standing with us in this because, like I said, we're not only just surviving last year, but the Lord is still expanding our ministry. My name is David and this is my wife Sharon. And uh, we were asked this morning to come and speak to you to share an experience we had a few years back um, with a family member of ours who had to spend some time in a treatment center. Many of you knew our daughter, know our daughter, Melody, who struggled with an eating disorder. And at the time, she struggled here for several years and was not able to get any help. But the Lord did lead us to a place called Ramuda, which was a treatment center, a Christian treatment center in Arizona. One aspect of the program there was something they called Family Week, and they encouraged any family members who could from the ladies who were being treated um, to come on a specified week and they had a program for us there. They also had a small uh, apartment that was fully furnished that we could kind of have as our retreat while we were there and it was it was a true blessing. Unfortunately, when the week came, Michael and Rachel were not able to join us, but our daughter Michelle could go with us, and um, we were thankful that she could go and join us. Our day started each morning with devotionals and times of worship, and then after that, the program fluctuated. Um, there was a lot of teaching. We thought we had known a lot about addictions, but we learned a whole lot more that week. And then the rest of the focus while we were there was on healing and preparation for when Melody was to come home. We found that um, we had a lot more to heal than we thought we did. And it was wonderful to have that time with a therapist present to help us through the process. They used a lot of different activities and a lot of different approaches. And um, at the end of the week, at the end of the day, the beauty was we could go home to our own apartment and kind of decompress and relax and try to process all that the day had had. Um, the final thing that they did was teach us how to prepare for discharge. And we feel that that was such a wonderful help to, to prepare us for what we'd be facing. Um, and these these sessions were good. I mean, Melody was there with us, both in the healing times and in the preparation for going home. She was not part of the, the teaching on addiction. She'd had that previously. And then there was social time, where we could just enjoy being together as a family. Yeah, all said, it was a, it was a great week. Um, it went a long way toward our daughter's uh, recovery. And in addition to uh, helping our daughter, I know personally the week helped me a lot in that uh, I learned a lot of empathy uh, rather than judgment for people with addictions uh, and or depression. And so I felt that was a, a huge part of the week. So in summary, we're very pleased to hear that the Village of Hope is uh, planning on having this family center we feel it'll be similar maybe to the experience we had. And uh, 
you know, again, we feel it'll be very beneficial in the uh, recovery of these men and especially uh, their whole families. So thank you for listening to us. Well, good morning. People. And more people with us online. But people. It is good to see you. And uh, thank you for joining us for worship. Thank you for those of you who continue to be a part of DBC online and worship in that way. Because the reality is we all can't be here. And uh, more people want to be here than... Uh, so you are the chosen today or the first to sign up. <laughs> and uh, we encourage folks, if they're here close by and want to uh, join us in worship, you need to get on that pretty early in the week these days. Uh, but we're so happy to still be able to offer worship in all kinds of different ways as we're scattered. And we are excited that we're heading towards Easter, the most glorious celebration. I know, you think it's Christmas, but it's not. <laughs> For us as God's people, it's Easter. And uh, we're excited to head towards Easter, and uh, it's just a few weeks away, um, three weeks away, I guess, but who's counting? And uh, we're just excited to share our Easter offering, and that's what you just saw there, is just the, the excitement and trying to help you catch the vision of why we think it's important to support Village of Hope. And so we want to encourage you to consider uh, this Easter giving. And, uh, well, we're going to talk a little bit more about giving, so I'm not going to talk about that right now. But uh, Village of Hope, we're going to be hearing more from them uh, a little bit, well, right after Easter, actually, and uh, just their exciting ministry. But we'll try and keep you informed what they're doing now. And, and like was mentioned and uh, that David and Sharon just testified to, the importance of a family center, a place where families can heal together and come and have visits and be taught and learn. And so that's what we want to get behind this Easter. And so we're really happy to be able to do that. And uh, I would just want to take a moment before we continue with our service to let the kids know that are here in person that we do have a kids time for you. And so kids, if you want to head up to jam time right now, now is the time. You can head, you can meet at the back, and you're going to meet Patricia back there and another awesome leader, Debbie, and uh, you're going to head upstairs for some uh, great time together. And I will tell you that our children's director, who I happen to know personally, I know that she is excited to be having kids in person upstairs with some cool new parents or grandparents who ever brought the kids today. Ask them about the cool new little table top. Uh, that they each got to use because we've been making some improvements. We've been trying to use the time wisely and we've been making some improvements and uh, doing some things that will help our children's ministry, um, including getting ready for some babies that are coming too and updating our nursery. So our children's ministries have been kind of doing some different things, online things, but also preparing the building for what we're all looking forward to, which is coming back um, and being together and needing space and needing... Um, yeah, needing some comfortable spaces. And so we've been doing some renovations that uh, we look forward to showing you when we get them all done. When I say renovations, that's probably too big a word, but a fresh coat of paint makes it look brand new, right? So you're going to think it's a brand new room because some of you haven't seen it in months and maybe a year. So, uh, But we're excited about some of the things that are going on. So God is still good. God is still working. And uh, we are excited for what he's doing. And like I said, we are excited um, for Easter, but also for the opportunity. I get excited every time we share our uh, Easter offering, our Christmas offering, our Thanksgiving offering. It's just so much fun to give and to bless people and to join with partners who are doing good things uh, in our community and in the name of Jesus. And so I want to just take a moment right now and I want to pray because Prayer is oh so important, and we need to be praying for the folks out of Village of Hope. Uh, they've had a very different year, too, and we need to be praying for their ministry 
and, uh, and the guys that are out there are receiving the support and the help and the treatment that they need and their plans for the future. And so let's just take a moment and, and let's ask God's blessing too over this, uh, this missions project, this Easter offering that we are going to begin to collect. You simply need to mark Easter on any envelope, any e-transfer, any giving that you do. If you just put Easter on it, then it will be designated to our Easter offering. And, um, and so we want to pray over that, and we want to ask God to bless so, so that we can bless. And so let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, it is good. It is good to be together. It is good to be in your presence. And whether we are here in person, whether we're online, wherever we're worshiping, whenever we have an opportunity to pause before you, God, we're just so thankful. And we're so thankful that you are a God who is good, and you are a God who gives. And we're just so thankful that... Uh, as you give, we can give. And uh, God, help us not to see it as a chore or, or something hard, but help us to see it as something that we want to do. And as we think about sharing and uh, blessing Village of Hope with our Easter offering, God, I just pray that uh, you will give us the means and you will open our hearts and you will stir us and you will prompt us. And even today, maybe somebody's listening, God, and you just are prompting them to help because they recognize the importance of Village of Hope and the ministry that's going on there. And so, God, thank you. We humbly thank you because we can just play a small part in what you're doing and what you're doing there in particular. And so, God, I pray for Andrew as he leads the Village of Hope here in New Brunswick. I pray for the other staff and the other folks that are pouring themselves into these men, and I pray for the men that are there even now. I pray that you'll give them strength and courage and commitment and that you'll give them patience and that they will stick with uh, the time there. And it can be difficult at times, I'm sure, but that they will persevere and that they will overcome in the name of Jesus. And God, I'm thinking about people today too that are struggling and that need help and that maybe are just a little bit afraid to get help to call out for help, to reach out for help. And I pray that they would indeed do that in some way, shape, or form, and that Village of Hope would have an opportunity to play a part in, in the lives of more men, Lord, who have these struggles. And God, we just want to be faithful. We want to be faithful in our giving. We want to be faithful in the way we use our resources. We want to be faithful in prayer. So will you help us to be committed in, in all these ways? God, and we just look forward, we just expect you to do something amazing over these next three or four weeks as, as we, yes, prepare for Easter and as we give, and, but then as you bless as only you can bless. And God, I want to thank you today. I want to thank you for David and Sharon. I want to thank you for their courage. I want to thank you for Melody allowing her story to be shared as well uh, through them. And Lord, I just pray for them today as a family and I thank you for the healing that you have brought in their family, and in other families because of uh, places like Ramuda and Village of Hope. And uh, God, we know, we know that your, your spirit brings healing. And we know that healing is possible. And remind us of that today, God. Lord, wherever we're at today, whatever we're dealing with, whether it's physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, God, remind us that healing is possible and that you bring healing into our lives, and you bring it in ways that we least expect sometimes. And so, God, I pray for anybody today who is in need of healing. Will you just provide for them? And may they be confident knowing that you're going to do that because you are a God who provides. God, as we go into your word today, we pray that you would provide for us, that you would open our eyes, you would open our ears. Most importantly, Father, you would open our minds and open our hearts to hear what you're saying today in the name of Jesus. God, I pray these things, and I pray that your spirit would rest upon each and every person who hears your word today, who hears these words today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if anyone has ever had a piggy bank. 
Anybody ever had a piggy bank? You know what I'm talking about here? Let me see. Come on, you're, you're here. If you're here, you know, put up your hand if you ever had a piggy bank. Pretty much everybody, if you haven't, maybe I could start one for you. Maybe I could start one for you today. If, if you're joining us uh, electronically today, just put a comment in. Say, yeah, yeah, I've had a piggy bank. How many of you still have a piggy bank? Anybody? Oh, a couple, three, four, a few of you. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. I mean, I think it's a good thing. I mean, I think piggy banks have kind of gone out of style, though, right? Like, because how do you put the change from your debit card when you use, well, there is no change, right? They just take it all. Right? Like, but change is kind of out of style. But when I was a kid, I had a piggy bank, and it didn't look like this. This is like an old man's piggy bank. I'm, this is my piggy bank now. You're like, hey, don't insult me. No, I'm talking about me. This is my piggy bank. This is what I do with the leftover change. This is like three years' worth of it. <laughs> it is, because I don't carry, you know, we don't carry cash anymore, right? So that's why piggy banks have kind of gone out of style, right? And so, but, but I do when I have because I don't like it weighted in my pocket, and I don't like it, so I throw it in here, and this is like my, my piggy bank. I remember when I was a kid, I actually had a piggy bank, right? It was a pig that you put the, you know, how many of you actually had a pig-shaped piggy bank? Yeah, come on, own up to it, I did, and I like inherited it. I don't know, I think it was my dad's, because it was like old, it looked old, maybe I'm just old, but, and, um, and it came with nothing in it, and then I used to put, you know, and it mostly had pennies in it, pennies. You know what those are? Yeah, some of us do, right? But so, well, today we're going to talk a little bit about giving. Because we're on this journey, the Red Letter Challenge is what it's called, and we're looking at the words of Jesus. And, and uh, as we've been looking at the words of Jesus, some of us have been reading a book every day, reading devotions every day. We've been working through different themes. We've talked about being with Jesus. We talked about forgiving, and that was a, a tough week. Last week we were talking about serving and how we can serve, and this week we're going to talk about giving. Giving. Right? And so... Uh, I, I got thinking about coins and giving, and, and actually we're going to read a story here out of God's Word, the story uh, where Jesus is talking about giving, and Jesus never shied away from the piggy bank. Jesus never shied away from talking about money and giving. And I, sometimes we do that now. Sometimes we, we kind of shy away from it, right? And we're going to see that Jesus didn't. Jesus wasn't afraid to talk to his followers and his disciples, and he wasn't afraid to talk about their pennies and their, their piggy banks and their money. And so today, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And uh, as we do, we're going to see what it means to follow Jesus and to give. And the passage of Scripture that we're going to look at is actually found in Luke chapter 21. So if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to get them out. Um, you don't have them to not use them. You want to use your Bibles. I hope you use them quite often, actually. So get your Bibles out. If you have a device, you can get your device open to the Bible. But I would encourage you, I would encourage you to, to get into God's Word, and we're going to do that today as we think about giving. And we, we, we learn a little bit about what Jesus says about money, because He says quite a bit about money throughout the New Testament. But I want to just talk a little bit about this passage in particular. But before I do, I need to set it up for you. I need to set it up. Because what we do here on Sundays and, and, and as we open God's Word, we just look at a little part of it, right? And I stress this a lot, and if you've heard me stress it before, I'm not going to apologize because I think it's important. Context is important, and we need to understand where this story takes place if we really understand the story. So this story, actually, that we're about to read takes place in the temple, so Jesus is in the temple, and you'd have to look back a few chapters to see that, that Jesus is in the temple, and he's in the temple, and he's, he's doing some teaching. He's actually taught about a number of things, and he's been teaching about a variety of things, but he seems to be working up to something, well, working up to a lot of things, but he's in the temple, and he's teaching, and as he sits there, he's making an observation as he sits there. So he kind of, he's doing some teaching, and then all of a sudden he 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 begins to people watch a little bit. Actually, this passage, Luke chapter 21, verses 1 to 4, which is what I'm about to read. Luke chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. This passage, uh, this observation that Jesus makes as he looks around the temple courts, and actually he's in the outer court, or the court of women. So he's in the outer area where everybody, well, except the Gentiles, that's, that's another story, but he's, he's where the majority of people are, the majority of the Jewish people can be, 
He's in this open temple court, and he's looking around, and he makes an observation. Right before this, he was doing some teaching. Right before this, he actually was doing some teaching, and he, he told his disciples to beware of the teachers of the law. Beware of the teachers of the law. And, and he's kind of, well, he's not kind of, he is. He's speaking against the teachers of the law and some of the things that they're doing. And so if, if, you, if you have your Bible open, I don't yet, so I better get it open. If you open to Luke chapter 21 and you just look above, just, just look back a little bit. He says in Luke chapter 20, verse 46, he says, Beware the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour with widows' homes and for a show make lengthy prayers. So Jesus, this is important, because some of you are like, yeah, 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 I know where you're going with this. I know you got a whole bunch of coins. You're talking about the piggy bank. They're in the temple courts. I know where you're going with this. Some of you, maybe not all of you, but some of you have heard this story before about a widow and her offering. But as I was studying this passage this week, I was like, hold it. We often just take this story out of the Scripture, and we don't realize what Jesus just did just before this. He just told his followers, beware. Beware of the teachers of the law, because this is what they do. It's, a, it's all about show for them. And they're, they're walking around with these it, dressed all nice and looking really good, and they sit in places of honor, but they devour widows' houses. See, and that wasn't the way it was supposed to be. In fact, the widows were supposed to be cared for, not devoured. So see the context? See what's going on here? See what's important? And then all of a sudden, we get into today's story. So it's nice to know a little bit of the background because to know what Jesus is kind of trying to point out here. I think he's trying to point out a more than just one thing. But So now with that background, that context, kind of, and I would encourage you maybe to, to when you have some more time, because we don't have the time right now, but when you have some more time, read back. Read what happened just before this passage of Scripture. It'll give you even more of an appreciation of what Jesus is trying to say. So Luke chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. This is the word of the Lord. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All those people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. This is God's word for us today. And let's receive it as a gift. And may it teach us something. And may we use our minds, because isn't it kind of interesting that right before Jesus looked around and pointed out this widow, he said, beware. Beware the teachers of the law who walk around, who walk around with their flowing robes, who walk around, and yet they devour the homes of widows, who walk around. You see, giving would have been a very public thing back then. We do giving very privately. You can decide what you think of it. I'm not, I'm not talking about that today, but the fact of the matter is it would have been public. In this outer court, in this court of women, there would have been 13 different places, kind of chess, kind of shaped like trumpets though, upside down trumpets. Anyway, there, I digress. There would have been public places where you could come in that outer court and you could put your offering, your gift to the temple. And so it would have been very public. That's why Jesus is kind of like, oh yeah, he's watching. And he's seeing people and he's seeing people kind of you know, and he just talked about these teachers of the law with their big robes and stuff. So this is my vision. You know, I don't have a big robe, but, you know, they probably... Just dumped out the whole piggy bank. Right? I don't know. It didn't quite say that. But if you put the two and two together, there's something going on here, friends, right? There's something going on here. And so people are making a big deal about their gifts. Now, this is, this is how we all give. Nowadays, it's very private.
right? And, the, and I, I kind of imagine this widow would have been ashamed, right? Because all these people given all their money, and she has these two little coins. And she's probably feeling pretty self-conscious. And she just kind of, you know, no big deal about it, just scurries off, probably head down, Right? That's how I kind of imagine, and I am, I'm imagining a little bit, but when you, when you begin to understand that before Jesus says this, he's looking around and he's, he's warning his followers, he's saying, beware the teachers of the law because they're a lot of show and they actually devour widows' houses. In other words, they're taking a lot. Well, that just makes sense because what did this widow just do? She took two coins, all that she had, that's what the scriptures say, all that she had and put it in. Right? So who gave more? The, Jesus' math is kind of funny, right? Right? Jesus, Jesus has a different way of doing math. Some of you have a different way of doing math. Some of you are like, yeah, the teacher always used to mark it wrong. I don't know what the teacher's problem was. They didn't know how I did math. Right? Jesus would have got the big X on the test, right? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law would have said, well, the, the person that dumped the piggy bank in gave the most. And Jesus says, uh-uh. no, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You see, it's not the person that gives. Well, Jesus sees things differently. And this is a really important principle for us to understand. It's a principle actually throughout Scripture. Uh, Jesus, the Son, is just viewing things as the Father views them, Right? And as the Spirit views them too, for that matter. Right? And we see it in the Old Testament. Actually, we're introduced to this theme really early on in the Old Testament. That we don't always see things the way God sees things. And God definitely doesn't always see things the way we see things. In 1 Samuel, this is one of my most, this is a favorite verse of mine. One of those verses that I truly love because I think it points us to something right away. And I just had to bring it up real quick. And, and, and God said something to Samuel. Samuel is trying to figure out who's the next king and the next leader is going to be. And as he's trying to anoint the next leader for God. And in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, we read this. But the Lord said to Samuel, The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Oh, I love that verse. I love that verse because it helps me understand this guiding principle that we see throughout Scripture. See, Samuel was looking for the next leader of God's people, and of course he was looking for somebody big and strong, somebody that he thought could lead his people, and God's like, no, 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 I don't look for the things you look for. I look past the things actually you look at. I look past the outer appearance, and I look directly into people's hearts. That's what I'm most concerned about this. And you see, you pull that principle forward, and and it makes sense because God and Jesus, you know, they think the same. And so as Jesus is watching people dump in their offering, as Jesus is watching these people make a spectacle, most likely of putting in all their coins, and then this widow comes with her two little coins, he says, "I I see things different. The outer appearance and all that money matters not to me. I'm looking past all the outer appearance, and I'm looking right to the heart. And I'm seeing in this widow, well, what, what, is, what is he seeing? What is he seeing? What's, this, what, what, what's he seeing here? Well, that's what I want to talk about just for a few moments, because as we think about giving, as we think about giving, what often happens is we, I, I'll just talk about me, I come up with reasons why I can't give. I, came up with, I come up with excuses. And this is what we begin to see in this passage, in this story that Jesus tells. He's pointing and, 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 and holding up the widow, yes, and he's saying, be like, you know, be like this. But he's also saying something about the others and the teachers of the law and those who have so much and yet give so little. Right? Because that's what's happening here. There's one that has so little and gives so much, and then there's another one who, who, who has so much and gives so little. See, giving has more to do with my heart than it does my bank account. That's what I realized this week. And I hope you realize it too. That giving has more to do with our heart 
than our bank account. Because in case you didn't realize this yet, you'll never have enough money in your bank account. You just, you just won't. In the, in the society we live in, the world we live in, on this side of the ocean, in Western civilization, there will just be, there just never will be enough money because there's, somebody's always making a new gidget, gadget, gidget, whatever. <laughs> somebody's always improving something. You can always buy something more. And there will never be a... So if, if our giving is only based on our bank account, well, why give? Because there's always more to buy. But giving has more to do with my heart than my bank account. And that's why this message is for everybody. It doesn't matter how much you have in your bank account today. You're like, well, I don't have enough money to give. We all can give. And in fact, Scripture points that out right here. The widow gave. We can all give, no matter our situation. Here's the thing. And I, I just, I just want to kind of give you some straight things right out of God's Word that I see here. It's not the size of the gift, but the size of the sacrifice. It's not the size of the gift, but it's the size of the sacrifice. See, that's what Jesus is pointing here. He looks past the coins. There was, a lot, some, there was a lot of people that put a lot more coins in the box, in the treasury, than that lady did. So it, it can't be the amount. There's something else going on. She just put in two. Just two. So why was it that Jesus pointed to her and said she gave the most? Well, it's because her sacrifice was greater. Her sacrifice was greater. There's this passage of Scripture. Like I said, this principle, we see this principle throughout Scripture. We can draw a line through, through all of the Bible. And I came across another passage, and it was Paul talking, the Apostle Paul. And so he should be just echoing the words of Jesus, right? Because it's in Scripture, and, and he's sharing the good news. And this is what he was telling the church at Corinth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12, he says, for if the willingness is there, he's talking about giving. Again, the Bible doesn't, doesn't uh, shy away from talking about money. We make it a very private thing. We don't like to maybe be told or hear about it. But the Bible doesn't shy away from it. And uh, it's a part of who we are and, and our faith as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. Paul's talking to the Corinthian church about giving. And this is what he says. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what? one has, not according to what he does not have. Huh. I, re I, I was really spending some time thinking about this passage this week. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. See, sometimes we, oh, well, I can't give, I don't have. Paul's like, don't worry about what you don't have. Think about what you do have. And, and then give. Well, actually, it's not just and then give, it's and then sacrifice. You see, giving should cost us something significant. Giving should cost us something significant. That's what we see here. The people that were marching up to the, the treasury and dumping in their offering, and it really cost them nothing, weren't really giving at all because they weren't sacrificing. Giving should cost us something. It's, again, the principle runs throughout Scripture, actually. In the Old Testament, it's called first fruits. Maybe you've heard about it, maybe you haven't. But this idea of first fruits. And in the Old Testament, the people were told that when they, when they because you know, money and that type of thing wasn't as big a commodity as actually food was, and growing things, and harvesting things. And so they were told that the first fruits that they grew, the first thing they harvested, needed to be brought to the temple. That was a principle. The principle of first fruits. Can you imagine? This is your livelihood. This is what you literally eat. And when it comes off the land, out of the ground, when you slaughter it, for the, the first thing you need to do is take it and give it to somebody else. Before you eat it, before you... You know, consume it as a family, you have to take the first thing you get and give it away. 
That's pretty significant. That's pretty significant. That's, that's the model of giving that we have. I wonder, I wonder how many of us give from the leftovers and not the first fruits. Hmm. You know, leftovers, you have them too, right? In the fridge, you know, the second time around. In our house, the only leftovers that get eaten the second time around are the cold pizza, right? Cold pizza, that's a good leftover. You know, if I come home, if we have pizza one night and I think I'm going to come home at lunchtime and get the pizza, it's gone because someone had it for breakfast, right? Most leftovers, the rest of them, that dad eats, they stay there for days and days and days. And I have to go, hey, Patricia, how long has this been in here? Is it safe to eat? And sometimes I think that's what we do when we give. Well, I got a little bit left over. I got some leftovers here, so I, God could probably use them. Leftovers for Jesus. Right? You know, there's a little bit left in this, so I'll give it away. But the principle that we see here in Scripture is actually, it's this principle throughout Scripture is sacrificial giving. It should cost you something significant. It should actually hurt to give. That's, that's the principle we see. It, it, you should go like, ah, oh. you should wrestle with it a little bit and go, this is costing me something. It's the first thing. It's the freshest fruit. It's the, the, the best fruit. It's you know, a lot of us give out of what we have left. And what Scripture is saying is, no, that's, that's not the Jesus way. See, sacrificial giving is an act of trust. Right? That's what first fruits was. And that's what's happening with this widow who puts her two coins in there. She's trusting God is going to take care of her. Because she just gave it all. And when people give their first fruits in the Old Testament, when they gave their first fruits, what they were saying to God is, God... I, I pray that I'm going to get some more, but you, you take the first. You take the first fruits. And so sacrificial giving is an act of trust. It's saying to God, you know what? I, I, I'm not so sure I can spare this, but I trust you. I trust you. I trust that just as you're going to provide, have provided, are providing, you're going to provide. And so that's the type of provision that we're, we're talking about here. We're talking, we're talking about trusting God enough to give sacrificially and to give up something significant. You know, we struggle with that. We struggle with this idea of trusting. I do. I'm, I'm always thinking. I'm like, I got, I got people in my house. I got to feed them. But to trust and to give away, and, and we've had this conversation over the years with our kids. And, you know, well, we, we're actually, we can't do this because we're going to give this to here. And I think those are good conversations to have. I think you need to model that. You know, what we often do is we just do all that stuff in private, right? And I know there's a reason for doing it in private, too. We don't want anybody boasting and dumping their, you know... And at the same time, we need to, we need to be honest and open and have these discussions so that we can challenge each other. And my prayer is today that this is a challenge. This is a challenge to make you think twice about giving. And giving, you know, like, oh no, I give. And in some ways I realize, because if you read the stats, a lot of people that are connected with churches are some of the best and bigger givers in this country. I've read the stats. And yet, I also have read how much we give and maybe how much more we could give. And you know, can we just give a little bit more? It's, it's, it, and can we do it first? Instead of giving at the end of the month, when you see what you have left, can you give at the first of the month? And say, God, I'm going to trust that you're going to provide for the rest of the month. So sacrificial giving is what is being held out here as the example and what the widow was doing and what the others weren't doing. <laughs> and she trusted she said, I trust God. I'm putting my last two silver coins, my last pennies in there, and God's going to care for me. God's going to care for me. Giving is also a weapon we can use to defeat the love of money. Giving, think about that for a moment. Giving is a weapon 
we can use to defeat the love of money. And I think we need some weapons in this fight because what I know, and I know this for sure, is that living where I live and living how I live and with all the temptations around me and all the things I could have and all the improvements I could make to my house and and all the vacations I could someday take and, you know, all the things, like, it's a, there, it, the temptation is constant. And you're like, no, 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 I don't love money. Well, when we say love money, we just mean that temptation to consume, consume, consume. The, the, the increase in storage units in North America is staggering. Look that up on the internet sometime. The increase of storage units. It seems like we're gathering. And, and so we need... We need to push back and we need to push against that temptation that's there. And so, I think giving is one way to do it. I know giving is one way to do it. Because when you actually let go and you give, you're saying to God, I trust you and I'm not going to fall into this trap of things and stuff and money. So, See this as a way to guard yourself against. If you're like, well, I think that's all I can give. Give just a little bit more. And you're pushing back against that temptation to keep and to hold on to what God has given you. Sacrificial giving requires us to live in this holy tension. There's actually this tension that's going on when we talk about giving. And the tension is this, and I've come to realize that we have to to live in a lot of tension. Do you feel this way as a follower of Jesus? I feel this way as a follower of Jesus. I feel like we have to live in tension sometimes. And this is one area where I'm kind of like, oh, I know I need to be responsible. Because I I think, I I know God calls calls us to be responsible, but He also calls us to be risky. And so this is one of those areas where we have to kind of live in this tension and we have to come before God and we have to begin to to figure out, okay, what are you calling me to do with the resources that you've given me? That's the key. The key is to be willing to live in this holy tension and, 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 and as we begin to think about how much we should give, yeah, be responsible, but also realize that we live in a culture where we're, we're tempted to keep and hold on to and hoard. And so sometimes it's good to be risky. Sometimes it's good to be risky. And we have, to, we have to kind of live in that holy tension, I call it. Why am I calling it a holy tension? Because it should be guided by the Spirit. Our giving should be guided by the Spirit of God. Not simply the mathematics of it all. Right? Remember we started by talking about Jesus' mathematics are a little off. Because he's like, no, no, no. The widow gave more. And they're all sitting there going, no, she gave like two coins. No, she gave more. And so we need to live in this holy tension. And that's what I'm calling us to today. And I want you to think about this week as you're thinking about giving. How can I, how can I give more? Not, we ask the wrong question sometimes. How much should I give? The question should be, how much more can I give? And God, are you calling me to give more. And if you are, to who? To where? To what? When was the last time you actually prayed and asked God to show you where to give to and how much to give? I think that we could be a little bit riskier in that regard. I know I could be. Now, I want to be guided by the Spirit because I don't want to be irresponsible. But what if, what if God said to you, I want you to give this much? What if you prayed and you spent a week praying and even fasting and and God said, I want you to give this much to to this organization, to Village of Hope, to the DBC Easter offering, or there's lots of other good things out there. And sometimes, get this, sometimes there's good things we should give to that aren't tax deductible. What? Really? Yeah. Now we are, (laughs) but sometimes, and we had a former treasurer here, if I can quote him, he used to say, not all good things are tax deductible. Right? Now, let me me say this. 
I mean, it's good to know something's registered, but sometime, could you imagine, sometime God might say to you, I just want you to go give that person a $100 gift card for groceries. Could you imagine if God did that? I think God does that. If we spend time with him and are open to this idea of sacrificial giving and not holding on and holding on and holding on. So, if it comes from God, how risky is it really? If he says, give it all away, oh, pastor, careful. He's not going to leave you in a spot. He's not going to take you somewhere and leave you there hanging. And so can we live in this holy tension when it comes to giving? And can we find ways to give? Now, we've been talking about money because that's what Jesus was talking about. There's other ways you can give too, but I think we need to be really careful in the world that we live in and the temptations we face that we don't hold on too tightly to money, to our financial resources. So we're going to sing this song uh, right now. Our worship team is going to lead us in our closing song. And uh, I want you to think about this song in light of what we were just talking about. So you're going to sing if you choose to, and it could be your prayer. If it's in your heart, you're going to sing, I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. Anybody, anybody a little bit afraid to say that, to sing that? That's risky. If you actually sing it and you mean it, it's risky. Because remember, God doesn't see like we see. He doesn't see like we see. So he might ask us to do something that's really risky. And, and I hope he does. And I say that as a leader of this church, kind of with fear and trembling. <laughs> because I like to play it safe too. I, I like the math and I like spreadsheets. And I like to figure everything out. But what that widow did didn't make sense. We all would have advised her not to do it. Maybe not you, but I would have been like, don't give it all. And she did. I will make room for you to do whatever you want me to.
surrender? Will you surrender it all to him? Will you pray this week? Will you pray, God, show me how you want me to give, who you want me to give to? And here's the scariest one. How much? How much? Sacrificial giving. It's an act of trust. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that we could gather today we thank you that we could look into your word. We thank you that we could, we could sing. And I pray that this song is a prayer that we would be willing to surrender whatever we're holding back. Maybe it's not money, but God, whatever it is that's, that's getting in the way of our relationship with you and hearing from you and getting in the way of our giving ourselves fully to you, God, will you just convict us and convince us this week? May we pray the hard things who, where, how much. God, help us to be like that widow, not afraid to risk, not afraid to be led by your spirit in what we give. God, thank you that you have all the resources we'll ever need and you are a God who provides. Help us to trust in you and be led by you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you today. We're here with us in person. I'm just going to invite you. You can, we'll empty from the back to the front. And uh, we're not going to kind of gather in the foyer. We're going to either head outside or you can go to the gym. We've warned the gym if you want to spend some time chatting, distanced in the gym or outside. Uh, thanks for joining us today. God bless you.